Well, thank you so much, Sam, for that wonderful welcome. And I told uh, Sam and her colleagues, I was feeling much loved. Uh, it's been a while since anybody's actually actively spoken with me about uh, my bridge research. I conducted this uh, study um, over 30 years ago now, which is just remarkable, but it's been integral to some of the other things that I've studied. So just getting, getting into um, how and what I learned, um, I need to really start with this uh, disclaimer. I didn't go into this with the idea that I was going to study bridge. Back in the 1980s, when I started my doctoral work at Penn State, I was an active uh, basketball player, a pickup basketball player. And my inspiration for studying bridge players really stemmed from that. I played regularly at noon, at least three times a week. And uh, um, I could pretty well predict who was going to be there. There were no officers, there were no flyers. We came and played regularly. And I became fascinated at the time about how playgroups like this were able to sustain themselves over time. If you're wondering who I am in that picture, I am the big goof there uh, wearing the shirt and the, the weird glasses. So my study of bridge was really consistent, or my uh, interest in basketball at the time was really consistent with my interest in different slices of life. I've always been fascinated with what at the time I used to call uh, leisure subcultures. I guess I was a bit of a voyeur. I was just interested in these uh, slices of life and what drew people to these types of things. But I was a study of uh, leisure. I took uh, my studies very, very seriously. And uh, uh, I was interested in the sociology and social psychology of leisure. And, uh, and I knew intuitively that leisure provided uh, important benefits to people and uh, meaning. You don't have to go much further than uh, a chorus line. And uh, if you're familiar with it, there was a character, Sheila, who somberly described in song her hellish hell life, but then she sang uh, about what ballet meant to her, and she says, uh, um, everything was beautiful at the ballet. So leisure could provide order for people amidst chaos. Going back even further, I uh, uh, was fortunate to have been assigned this reading during my doctoral work, uh, Homo Ludens by the Dutch historian Hosan uh, Hoisinga. And uh, he argued that uh, leisure or play was fundamental to the formation of culture. And he argued that uh, play promoted the formation of playgroups. So I understood that leisure would bring people together. And of course, this article by Smith, a Brit, uh, uh, brought that point home really nicely. And uh, he documented that uh, um, these uh, regulars to this uh, British pub fostered community and helped provide community. And Smith described the pub as, quote, an oasis of certainty for regulars in what he called a hostile and external world. So I was keenly interested in how playgroups fostered community and how these groups sustained themselves over time. So this next slide really shows you a snapshot of some of the uh, uh, the works or, or books or uh, ideas that inspired me to actually study bridge players. Um, the two of the, the books here, Amateurs and Conflict in the Great Outdoors, really provided me an idea that there were some people who actually devoted themselves to leisure pastimes. They were highly committed to the pastimes and they it became a central life interest. For those of you who with an academic uh, bent, you might be more familiar with Stebbins, but at the time when I was doing my dissertation, his ideas about ser serious leisure rather were, were rather incipient. Much more influential was Hobson Bryan's work, who really looked at participants along a continuum of, invol continuum of involvement from casual to serious. But I frame my study within the context of symbolic interaction. So ideas by Bloomer and Fine really helped me understand how uh, these groups uh, um, were, were not only units of social organization, but they were people actively creating culture and so trying to sustain themselves over time. And this led me to uh, um, focus on 
these play groups as social worlds. And Unru defined these social worlds as amorphous collection of actors, organizations, events, and practices that have coalesced into spheres of interest, or what I would call culture areas. So I liken play groups to these social worlds, and I understood that players were going to be uh, linked to each other, not only in the context of these groups, but perhaps uh, um, through other groups or more vertically through different organizations. And so I knew that these social worlds were highly diverse. They were segmented or differentiated. And so if I was to study bicycling, I would have to understand the various subworlds of bicycling. Not all bicyclists are the same. And the same is true for climbing. The same would be true for basketball. So one of the things I, uh, uh, going into this study, was I, I knew that people were going to vary in terms of their uh, uh, commitment. So this particular diagram gives you an idea of this continuum of involvement, and people can be uh, um, classified uh, in terms of uh, low commitment or very, very high commitment. So those people on the low end tend to be occasional, casual players, maybe even tourists. Highly uh, committed people are going to be the insiders. They're going to be the people who are going to be organizing uh, involvement for others. Again, Stebbins' ideas were incipient, and I mu was much more relying on Brian at the time. But why study bridge? Well, the easy answer is it was visible and it was accessible. I wanted to study a variety of adult playgroups. That was key to this. And I was a little too close to basketball. Some of the competitiveness would come out at times and I realized that was probably not the best place for me. So when I was studying bridge, I knew about bridge. I mean, you've got Charles Gorin here who appeared on Sports Illustrated six times. He appears as the, the king of uh, hearts and Time Magazine. So bridge was part of the American culture at the time. And I knew people who were playing bridge. And uh, I had older siblings who played bridge. I knew people who uh, talked about, oh yeah, we used to play bridge all the time in college. And so when I was putting together my doctoral proposal, I decided to study bridge because I knew that there were lots and lots of groups out there that I could study. So I had a couple of guiding research questions as I went into this, and it's not important that I read all of this, but on the one hand, I wanted to understand the groups as, or play groups as social worlds. So I was understanding the, the, uh, uh, um, the, the group uh, of foundations and dynamics of, of these, uh, these uh, uh, bridge groups. So I was interested in the various segments within the bridge groups and you know, how these things arose, what, how they were related to patterns of activity and what the basis of activity legitimacy was. And I was also interested in the individuals themselves. And uh, again, I'm, I'm relying quite a bit on Brian's ideas about recreation specialization here. So uh, um, who were these people and what indicators were there uh, were useful in differentiating them along a continuum of involvement? So, uh, and I was also interested in whether or not these people could be sequentially organized as stages along a continuum of involvement. So much of the uh, prior research up to this time had assumed that people would actually progress the longer they participated in this activity. Just a word uh, uh, really on methodology. Um, my study was in ethnography. I was in the field for a year. So I found four groups of uh, bridge players that allowed me to uh, be a participant observer. I was a kibitzer, I was a player. I watched people as they played. Uh, um, and I, I watched probably over about a six month period. I also interviewed close to 40 people um, who were part of these groups. And I also uh, uh, read as many documents as I could. I read bridge magazines. And uh, so it was the early stages of the internet. So there was this thing called Net News. It was a bulletin board about bridge players. So I really became a, uh, um, uh, um, engrossed in the social world. I was fascinated by bridge, and at the time, I really enjoyed playing the game. So let me get into some of the major findings that I, I was able to glean from this. And one of the, the first things I discovered was, yeah, indeed, 
the social world was differentiated. And the primary source of differentiation was the uh, um, sociability versus seriousness of the game. It's important to note that these were native terms by the bridge players. Early on, people would say, oh, we play serious bridge. We do not play social bridge. The social players would say, oh, we don't play serious bridge. They're too cutthroat. We play social bridge. This became reinforced over and over and over again. So this helped me create a typology of bridge groups that allowed me to uh, uh, differentiate these groups in terms of various uh, uh, patterns of activity. So things like uh, recruitment processes, types of conversation, and their overall function. Another major finding or uh, uh, um, paper that I was able to get out of the, the study was uh, based on really the ideas about specialization. So I was able to identify four major types of players, and they could be fitted loosely along a continuum of involvement. So I, I created a typology of uh, players based on or that reflected uh, different styles of involvement. Um, and one of the important things I was able to learn from this and that's carried over with me the rest of my career is these players don't necessarily progress to higher stages of involvement uh, of the longer they participate. Many individuals are willing to, to participate at what we might call a, a lower stage of involvement for their, their entire life and be content with that. By the way, I did identify occasional participants and uh, uh, that's the category of participation I would describe myself at the present time. And I can go into that later on if you wish. Okay, stop for a second. These are snapshots of people playing bridge. And in many ways, these people looked an awful lot like the people that I studied. Regrettably, I did not take photos back uh, in 1989 or 1990 of the people that I study. I wish I had, but many of these people at the time were elderly, older than I was. It didn't really occur to me that they were elderly until many of them just kept telling me, boy, you're young to be a bridge player, really. One of the things that I found fascinating at the time, it was problematic, was that many of these groups did not meet as often as they said they did. Now, how am I gonna collect data if they're not meeting? And it was a classic case, if you're an ethnographer, of not being able to see the forest for the trees. And I realized at the time that I was not only studying bridge players, but I was studying a, a pastime that consisted primarily of older adults and a game that was aging every day. And this led me to write about uh, uh, the decline of bridge in the United States. And it has waned markedly over the last uh, uh, 70 years. And uh, um, as other pastimes have taken hold, because of various changes in society, popularity of of bridge in the United States has uh, waned uh, markedly. This quotation from a college student, I was teaching a, so a sociology class while I was pursuing my doctoral work, really gets at some of the images that young people at the time had of bridge players. What comes to mind when I think of bridge players? The older generation. My grandmother always asked me, don't you kids ever play bridge? To me, it's a game for older people. I mostly picture little haired, little blue haired ladies playing. My current college students, most of them don't even know what bridge is. They don't know that it's a card game. Following up on this, I decided to actually start studying uh, constraints related to, uh, to bridge. And, but I wanted to study it from the point of view of uh, uh, bridge groups. I didn't want most studies on constraints, even to this day, focus on uh, uh, from the point of view of the individual. I wanted to understand how constraints arose within the context of these groups. And just as an example, just being a member of a group can facilitate participation. And if you're not a member, that's going to constrain your participation. So if you're not a member, and if you, don't, you can't find a, a partner in a tournament uh, uh, um, setting, you're likely not to participate very often. So I was interested in, in how dynamics of these groups created problems uh, for individuals. 
The last study um, that I've written about bridge was only about five years ago with a former student of mine. And I, I, I wanted to develop this idea about a post-mortem. And those of you who are into bridge probably recognize this term. It's a native term here in the United States it's where people talk about their bridge uh, hands after the game. And many of the serious players would go to, to clubs or bars or wherever and talk about the games. Or maybe they would get on the T or excuse me, telephone, maybe they'd get on the internet and they would dissect hands. One of the things I learned is these postmortems really provided meaning for these people. It provided them continuity over time, helped them become better players, and it provided a, a way that they could bond with other players. Because in some of these tournament games or, or social or uh, um, serious games, um, interaction tends to be uh, uh, f frowned on. And so uh, um, these postmortems provided a way for our players to bond, have fun, and uh, uh, cement their relationships with other people. So some final thoughts, and some of these are based on my bridge study, but some of these are, are, are things that I've gleaned uh, with some of my students or in my own studies since then. I think leisure scholars often ignore what Meyerson called the, in, the connectedness of humans. So, so much of North American leisure focuses on the individual, and we don't study people in the context of groups that they uh, uh, pursue pastimes with. And that's how I, I focus my bridge study. And I would argue that the, that indictment is still true today among North American scholars. I think it's very unwise to assume participants, bridge players and others are naturally progress over time. I think one of the, the great challenges we all face in, in uh, our leisure is finding people who like to do things at our pace. And we're all striving for community. And frequently, if we can find people who like to do things uh, the way we do it, we're gonna continue to do things that way. And so people aren't necessarily going to progress. One of the things I've learned, but become much more aware of uh, in my career is that leisure social worlds are highly racialized and gendered. I didn't focus on this very much in my bridge study. Uh, I would argue that uh, I should have, but uh, um, that's for you folks to do. And the main thing I guess I, I learned from bridge and the thing that's carried over with me for the last 30 years is social world members coalesce on the meaning they ascribe to activity. So it's not just social, it's not serious, it's what the me activity means to people. And so that to me is a defining characteristic of uh, uh, what it means to be involved in a social world. So I'm gonna stop there. I gotta tell you guys, I am thrilled to be with you all. Uh, I'm feeling much love. It's wonderful to see my articles uh, um, be uh, resurrected. That one article about the death of Bridge or the decline of Bridge, it actually was published in a, in a journal that uh, died shortly after it was published. I don't know if there was a coincidence, was, but I'm hoping that you folks uh, uh, can give that uh, article a little bit more traction than it's gotten today. So thank you very much.